a new brine shrimp kit has just dropped, this time marketed as a Sea Creatures Aquarium by Thames and Cosmos. They're a well-known producer of science-based kits and board games, so this kind of product is right up their alley. They differ from other products like sea monkeys or aqua dragons in that their approach is more education rather than entertainment focused, and you'll see that come through in several areas as we go through this kit. Now, I don't know too much about this brand, but it seems that this isn't their first brine trim kit, as I found a few others by Cosmos by doing a quick Google search. And I'm not sure if they're a German-based company, but for whatever reason, they do have a very strong presence in the German market. And I apologize in advance for absolutely butchering these names, but there's Sea Dogs and its German counterpart Urzeitklebse, Sea Dogs Extreme and Salzklebse Überlebenskünstler in der Wüste, and also Wusselende Salzklebse. I've not tried any of these before though, but if you guys want a review, I will try to get around to doing it at some point. Now, I saw this kit pop up on Amazon for the first time just a few weeks ago for the low price of $11.50. And I liked the look of the tank, so I thought it was worth checking out. I'll leave a link to it in the video description for anybody who's interested in picking one up too. The Sea Creatures Aquarium kit comes in a nice compact box, and I really like the direction they've taken with the packaging. The teal blue colour they've chosen suits the product well, and the large photo of the tank gives you a good impression of what to expect. Since they've decided to take an educational approach though, with this being a STEM product and all, I will hold them to a higher standard of accuracy in regards to their information. In nature, brine shrimp are found in ephemeral pools and lakes, so they're not sea creatures or ocean animals like this packaging implies. I know this is kind of just some marketing to get kids excited, so I guess I can give them a pass for now. Turning over to the back and we get some more information about the kit, an explanation about how it works, and a diagram showing each of the different contents. There's the mention of an 8 page full colour PDF guide that can be downloaded from their website too. I had a quick flick through this and again they've done a really nice job. It basically covers everything a good handbook should. General information, an easy to follow setup guide, care and feeding instructions, and some nice info about the biology of your pets. You might have noticed that the back of this box also mentions that there's exclusive podcast content with Brian Trump facts to listen to as you undertake your journey with this product. There are eight audio tracks in total, and the voice acting is top notch with a very polished and professional feel. But all up, it's only about five minutes worth of audio content. Through a quick Google search, I did manage to find a Wow in the World podcast episode about the Great Salt Lake, which is 20 minutes long, so they probably should have just linked to that instead. Overall though, the work that's gone into this kit is impressive. Let's see what's inside. I didn't mention this earlier, but this box has this nice matte texture to it. It's kind of hard to explain, but it adds to that premium product feeling. Alright, so it looks like we've got a lot to cover here. As always, we'll get started by first taking a look at the paperwork. This kit comes with a manual, and to be honest, it's impressively big. It looks to be just a physical copy of the one available for download on their website. After years of looking at brightly lit screens, I've recently started to fall back in love with physical media, so it's nice to see that they've included this. Next up is a colourful sticker sheet featuring some aquatic animals. I guess these are to place onto your tank, though I generally avoid doing this for two reasons. One, it obscures your view of your pets, and when they're pretty small anyway, blocking them with stickers just isn't helpful. The second reason is that despite what you might think, I'm not 8 years old. We'll move on now to our aquarium accessories. There's a 3mm pipette, which is always nice to see, and a large magnifying glass, which comes with a carabiner clip so you can carry it on your hip for your convenience. There's actually a video advertising this Sea Creatures kit on the Thames and Cosmos YouTube channel, and in it they mention that this magnifying glass is reusable. Love it. So much better than those wasteful single-use magnifying glasses, am I right? The last accessory is a lime green feeding spoon. The food scoop end is really small, which I actually like to see, because it makes sure people feed their pets an appropriate amount. It would be nice if the shaft had a bit more girth to it though. This one feels pretty small in my large hands. Next up are the packets, and this kit comes with four, two of which are pure sodium chloride, the third being our brine shrimp eggs, and the last being the brine shrimp food, with its contents being listed as brewer's yeast. I'm glad to see the transparency with the ingredients here. It lends itself well to the educational approach of the product. One thing I will note is that the use of just sodium chloride as a salt seems like a simplistic approach. From what I can gather, brine shrimp really do benefit from other trace elements in their water, like potassium, calcium, and magnesium. 
And the booklet even mentions this in their helpful tips section where it says, if you want to obtain more salt, brine shrimp prefer a mixture of sodium chloride and other mineral salts. It's best to buy sea salt without additives. So I don't know why they've just used sodium chloride here, but anyway, I guess we'll see if it works. And lastly, we of course can't forget about the tank. All right, I've got a lot to say about this. My first impression is that I really like it. The thin round shape is both interesting and practical, and it somewhat resembles a fish bowl, which is a nice touch. Down the bottom, the base flares out ever so slightly for more stability, and the blue color choice they've gone with is appropriate for the product's ocean theme. I do have a bit of a gripe with the lid though. It has some breathing holes, which is nice, but taking it off is unnecessarily difficult. It has these four little hooks which keeps it overly secure. It's not really an issue now, but when it comes to removing the lid to feed your pets, this is definitely going to be hazardous. It seems like the easiest way to remove it is to push the lid firmly towards yourself and then lever it up, but it's still annoying. Inside the tank is just a recessed bottom. I would have liked to have seen some texture here to help with algae growth, but it's not a huge deal. And now of course, the f***ing sticker. Alright, Thames and Cosmos, if by any chance you're listening, by all means, include this sticker in your kit. But please, put it on a separate sticker sheet so people can choose whether they want to put it on the tank or not. It looks tacky, you can see the glue under it, and it obscures your view into the tank. Now, I did try to remove it up here in the corner, but I could see that it was going to leave behind that sticky residue, which is always just a pain to get off, so I've decided to leave it on. Thank goodness the other side of the tank has been left blank. I've actually just noticed that the plastic does have these weird vertical lines running down it, which is a little annoying, but not a deal breaker by any means. Overall, I do like this tank. I just think some minor tweaks would improve it a lot. Alright, enough yapping. Let's set it up. Now the instruction manual that comes with this kit says to use tap water, and usually I'd avoid this because tap water often has additives like chlorine and fluoride, but for a bit of fun, I'm going to try it out. It says to boil your water on a stove top and then let it stand so it returns to room temperature. Boiling water allows any chlorine to evaporate a little more quickly, but you could also just let it stand for 24 hours or so instead. After that, you can go ahead and pour it into your tank, filling it pretty much to the top of that sticker. Next, I need to pour in the entirety of one salt packet and dissolve it with the pipette. It seems they give you an extra salt packet in case your first batch of sea creatures doesn't work out and you wanted to give it a second shot. And that's also why they suggest only using half of the egg packet for this setup. The booklet says that around 90% of your Norplee won't reach adulthood, but that there's enough eggs in here that your surviving 10% will still give you a decent colony. To be honest, this packet had way more eggs than I was expecting. They give you a few thousand, which is definitely overkill. I added in less than they recommend, only about one quarter of the packet here, but I suspect even this is far too many. Hopefully it won't affect the water quality too much. I'll be keeping this tank in my favourite brine shrimp growing spot, the windowsill. The weather's quite warm here at the moment, and this window is getting plenty of early morning sun, so I don't need to use a strong aquarium heater, which is lucky, because they won't fit in the top anyway. I will be using an under tank heat mat though, which is a good option when you only need to increase the tank's temperature by a few degrees. I'll pop in an airline for oxygen and water circulation too. There will be a link in the video description to an Amazon list with all of these important accessories for anybody who wants to pick them up for their setups at home. The booklet says it will take a day or two for our sea creatures to hatch, so I'll see you then for an update. So many babies. So, as expected, we've had a massive hatch rate of sea creatures. It's been about 30 hours since adding the eggs, and there's now around 100 Norpli jumping around in the aquarium, and I can still see some emerging from their eggs. It's kind of difficult to see with this annoying sticker in the way, so I'm going to turn the tank around to give us an unobstructed view into the water. Now, the issue with having too many babies is that a tank of this size can only support around 50 adults. That means a whole lot of these hatchlings will inevitably die off, and their rotting corpses can quickly degrade the water quality if you don't have a sufficient population of microorganisms to clean things up. Hopefully we don't have any issues, but I'll keep you updated regardless. The guidebook says not to feed the sea creatures for the first few days, so I'll check back in with you soon for the first feeding. Well, most of them have died. I had a look in the tank this morning, and it seems that about 90% of them are now gone. This was kinda to be expected, but it's still a shame to see. 
The ones that have survived seem to be doing fine for now though, so hopefully we can get these ones to adulthood. Now that we're three days in, it's time for the first feeding today, and the food which came with this kit is a powdered brewer's yeast. A nice departure from the spirulina powder that a lot of these products seem to include these days. The yeast is a beige colour, and it looks like they've put quite a lot in here, so it should last us a long time. I'm interested to see if this will have any effect on the colour of our sea creatures as they get larger too. I'll check back in with you guys in a week or two for another update to see how things are getting on. Hey guys, how's it going? I've given this tank a bit of time to sort itself out and settle down, and things in here are finally looking good. We're now 18 days in, and the population in the sea creatures tank has really bounced back. A few days after the last update, I topped the tank up with some fresh water, which made a whole lot more of those eggs hatch. It seems that the second wave of babies is faring much better than the first, which is a real relief. There's around 100 in here right now, and a few adults too, who are from that first wave of hatchlings. You might have also noticed some green algae starting to colonise this tank, and I think this is probably a big part of the reason as to why things are now going so well in here. A lot of people who try out these brine shrimp kits often find that their colonies fail within the first two weeks. They then retrace their steps, trying to figure out where they went wrong. Did they use the wrong type of water? Was the temperature too cold? Should they have aerated the water more? While these things can all contribute to a tank's downfall, the main reason is most likely because of a sharp ammonia spike, which happens because the nitrogen cycle has not yet been established in the tank. You see, when aquarists set up a new aquarium for their fish, they usually won't actually add any fish into the tank for a month or so while the tank cycles. This is the process of allowing the nitrogen cycle to fully establish. Cycling a tank is a pretty straightforward process. Fish food is periodically added into the water as if fish were already in the aquarium. This allows beneficial bacteria, algae, and microorganisms to colonize the tank, which form a healthy foundation for the ecosystem which is capable of converting toxic ammonia into less harmful nitrites and nitrates. It's only at this point that fish are finally added into the aquarium where they'll then have a much better chance of surviving. Cycling a tank is a common practice with fish keepers, but isn't something that's usually done by those of us raising brine shrimp. And it's understandable why. These kits don't tell us to cycle the tanks, nor do they really give us the opportunity to, as the salt and eggs are typically bundled together. This is why so many of these kits fail in the early days, and it's also why this kit is finally doing well 18 days after it was originally started. The algae and microorganisms in here are helping to maintain good water quality, and the sea creatures are thriving as a result. So yeah, I'm not telling you that it's essential to cycle your tank. It's not, but it will greatly increase your chances of success if you do. Anyway, I'm going to leave this tank for another few weeks so we can see how many of these sea creatures make it to adulthood, and so I can give you my final review. I'll see you in a month or two, or like, in a few seconds. Good morning! It's been a little over a month since we last had a look at this tank, and something really unexpected has happened, and I'm curious to see how many of you will spot it. I'm happy to see that a surprising number of these sea creatures have now survived through to adulthood. In fact, this might actually be one of the biggest colonies I've ever produced from one of these brine shrimp kits. Something I often notice with adult Artemia is that they display negative phototaxis, meaning they actively avoid bright light. I think this is probably an evolutionary trait they've developed to avoid avian predators. Diving deep during the day and then surfacing at night is an easy way to avoid detection, and it's why these brine shrimps spend most of their daylight hours down the bottom of the tank, as they are right now. You might have noticed that the sea creatures are all quite small too, which I assume is on account of there being so many in the tank, but that's not really what I'm most surprised to see here. Have you spotted it yet? Over 50 brine shrimp and not a single male. That's right, every one of these sea creatures is a female. Most brine shrimp species have a pretty even 50-50 split of the sexes, so having this many and not a single male is almost a statistical impossibility. So what's going on here? At first I thought we were looking at Artemia parthenogenetica, a species of brine shrimp composed entirely of females, and as the name implies, they reproduce exclusively through parthenogenesis, where the females create genetically identical clones of themselves. The thing is, the more I looked into this, the more confusing it all got. As many of you are aware, all brine shrimp species are capable of parthenogenetic reproduction, and sometimes 
there are exclusively female parthenogenetic populations of brine shrimp where males do exist within the species, but they're just not present in every population where that species exists. For those of you who read comics, it's kinda like the Mascara, the island nation where Wonder Woman comes from, which has outlawed all men from visiting the archipelago. Now, to murky the waters even more, some scientists don't even recognize Artemia parthenogenetica as a species, and they can't even all agree on how to classify these animals, so everyone's just kind of out there giving them different names. I've even noticed the same thing in the aquarium hobby, where eggs are sold using the Artemia salina and Artemia franciscana names interchangeably. And since it's usually just aquarium hobbyists who are buying the cysts to feed baby brine shrimp to their pet fish, they don't really give a shit what species they are. A group of scientists in Spain tried to address this issue in a 2021 paper titled Settling Taxonomic and Nomenclatural Problems in Brine Shrimp by Integrating Mitogenomics, Marker Discordances, and Nomenclature Rules. In simple terms, they're proposing a naming structure to clean up this mess. So, the question still remains. What f***ing species of brine shrimp is in my tank? I mean, even just seeing them in here was really unexpected. Every other brine shrimp kit we've looked at on this channel use Artemia salina or Artemia franciscana eggs, species that have both males and females. Even the guidebook shows photos of males and has anatomy diagrams for them. So Thames and Cosmos going for the eggs of a parthenogenetic population here is an unusual choice, but to be fair, probably one they weren't even aware of. Regardless, it is still quite exciting to see a new species, even if they do look pretty much identical to all the others. In fact, I couldn't actually spot any differences until I used a macro lens, which is when I noticed... and pause. That right there. The secondary antennae on the heads of these females are definitely a little larger than what you typically see in Artemia salina and franciscana. Usually these antennae are quite short. In fact, it's the male brine shrimp who typically have really large secondary antennae, which they of course use for claspers and mating. So the morphology of the female's antennae in the sea creatures aquarium has in a way masculinized, which is quite interesting to observe. Other than this befuddlement, my experience with the Sea Creatures kit has been a bumpy but good ride. While the tank isn't perfect, they get a lot right, and it is cool to see that so many of them ended up surviving. While making this video, I did see a post on Reddit by a user who was also trying out this kit, and they managed to remove the large decal sticker, though through a fair bit of effort and strong cleaning products to get rid of the excess glue that it left behind. If I could start this kit over, I'd probably take the time to do the same thing, because the tank looks so much cleaner without it. So, would I recommend this kit? Well, for the price, it's actually pretty good value, especially when you consider that there's enough salt and eggs to give the whole process a second try if you mess up the first time. And while I would have preferred them to use brine shrimp eggs from a population that has both males and females, it's cool to see something a bit different for once. If you're looking to add a new tank to your collection, or just try out something new, I think this is worth giving a shot. Let's just hope they update the tank to remove that annoying sticker. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.